Okay, welcome to week three of New Testament survey, the teachings of Jesus. What you hear, hopefully, in the background is Rachmaninoff cello, sonata, first movement. And I uh, just wanted to add a little bit of uh, spice to the lecture. Um, just seemed like there should be some uh, background music. Today we're going to cover the teachings of Jesus. And we're obviously not going to cover each one individually, but uh, but the characteristics of them. I don't know why this is not playing. Okay, I'm really interested in this because um, of the miracles. The miracles that are in the Gospels will be the first thing that we talk about. Um, you might remember in another lecture I said that. You know, you really can't reproduce the miracles of Jesus. Um, that is, I've seen a lot of, mir of uh, movies about Jesus and skits at church and dramas, and you really cannot replicate a blind person receiving their sight or a mother receiving her dead child uh, alive again in her arms. There's just no way to wrap your imagination around the lives that Jesus changed whenever he was in his year of public favor. There are 77 miracles in the Gospels, and in Mark, 30% of the material is orientated towards miracles. Now, I was raised to understand miracles as myth and that is you know as a New Testament scholar I was taught uh, not necessarily by my professors at Wayland well actually not by my professors at Wayland but by the critical scholars that I read um, both at Wayland and at Bright Divinity School uh, it was popular to view all of the miracles in the Gospels as legends or myths about Jesus. And I've been leaning more and more towards um, you know, a belief that Jesus actually did perform miracles, but uh, there are a lot of different uh, kinds of miracles uh, in the Gospel, and some of them may well be myth, and some of them may well be um, completely true. But I never gave up on the miracle of the resurrection and that allows me to work backwards and accept um, all the other miracle stories because uh, what is greater than Jesus rising from the dead okay some scholars have suggested as I said just as, just now some, some scholars think that the evangelists that and the evangelists are the writers of the Gospels they invented the stories of Jesus' miracles. Now, this is a very tempting thing for scholars to believe because we're taught that any, any historical effect has to have a historical cause. And that is, the historical effect is the miracle. But there is no historical cause for a miracle. There's no way to replicate it. As I said, we just can't wrap our imagination around it. And we cannot uh, observe another miracle taking place in the same way that we can observe things that happen in the natural world. And so it became very popular for scholars, Christian scholars, to say that the writers of the Gospels simply invented the stories of Jesus' miracles. But Metzger uh, thinks that there are, well he actually is right, there's little embellishment on miracles. That is, the miracles in the New Testament are pretty much bare bones. You know, Jesus it says that Jesus was walking on the road, and there were two blind men, and Jesus healed them. There's not a lot of uh, embellishment on them. Like, uh, it's not encased in the whole legendary or mythological story. It's just, this is what Jesus did. So, Metzger thinks that it's not... Um, convincing that the evangelists simply invented the stories. 
And he notes that unlike the Christian Apocrypha, uh, Jesus' miracles are restrained in number. But yet we just saw, you know, 30% of the Gospel of Mark is orientated towards miracles. So I'm not sure if that argument holds much weight, but uh, that's what Mesker says. Okay. There is, as I, oh, well, Metzger says that we should avoid the common prejudice against the possibility for miracles. That is, we live in a scientific age where people are pretty prejudiced against the possibility for miracles. That is, we've figured out everything, or we like to think that we've figured out everything, so we explain the ancient miracles in light of current scientific discovery. And so demon possession is no longer a demon, but epilepsy. Um, the blind man did not suddenly see, he was just never blind in the first place. Or it was just a made-up story. Metzger notes, and uh, I think this is irrelevant, but uh, even Jesus' enemies Note his power. He, Jesus was known by some Romans as a magician, or, or actually some uh, Jews write that Jesus was a magician. And in the, in the Bible itself, the Jew, some Jews say that he's in league with the devil, and that's why he can do the things that he does. So Metzger tries to argue that... Um, because Jesus' enemies note his power, that Jesus might actually have some power. But we're getting these stories from uh, secondhand encounters. You know, like the text that calls Jesus a magician uh, was written like a hundred years after Jesus lived. And the in league with the devil is in the Bible itself. So that really can't be used as proof that Jesus did miracles. We need an external source. One thing that I think is very strong about Metzger's argument is that every strata of the literary tradition includes miracles. And by strata, we mean um, the New Testament stories did not spring out of uh, Zeus's thigh like Aphrodite. I hope that's the one that sprung out of his thigh, fully fully developed. Uh, the New Testament went through a lot of stages. And we can see in the text that every stage of literary development in the text includes miracles. Now that's pretty strong. And what it means is miracles were a part of the very first Christian gospel. You know, when Christians first started talking about Jesus, they were talking about miracles that he performed. So that's pretty, uh, ex pretty good evidence that at least Christians have believed it since the very, very beginning. And one thing I've, I've uh, written and, and preached is that the ancient people knew what blindness was, and they knew what it meant to be healed from blindness. They knew what leprosy was, and they also knew when somebody was cured of leprosy. These people were not idiots, and they were more closely aware of their own bodies than we are. You know, we gotta go to the doctor for every little thing, and they had to wing it. You know, they're, they were poor, and uh, there wasn't much they could do so they and also they died in front of they died at home in front of each other so there was a better awareness of the mechanics of life back then so i think just to dismiss all these miracle stories um is is just premature because of this this single point that every strata of the literary tradition includes miracles and Metzger goes on to say it's not the number of witnesses, but the quality of witnesses. Okay, this is the second half of uh, Metzger's principles for interpreting miracles. 
I, I thought this was really interesting. I have never uh, put two and two together on this uh, point one and point two, but he doesn't accept that every miracle in the New Testament happened exactly, literally, as the New Testament says, because he can say some non-miraculous events could have developed into miracle stories, like the fig tree. It's not really that miraculous that a fig tree withers up and dies. And it looks like someone took this kind of uh, thing that people see regularly and worked it into a miracle story about Jesus uh, cursing a fig tree. It isn't bad. It's a good teaching. Um, it's useful to us. But it, more than likely, it w originated as a non-miraculous event. And then also, some non-Christian stories could have been attributed to Jesus. He says, like, the demons and the pigs. Now, I don't know of a story, and we would say here, uh, non, uh, we would say uh, pagan stories, like the stories about the Jesus mysteries. And I hate to say that, but, you know, there were some pagan stories that could have been attributed to Jesus. I don't know what he's talking about when he refers to the demons and pigs incident, and that's where Jesus casts out uh, a bunch of demons from a man, and they go into a herd of pigs. Um, I have heard that it is a pagan story. I cannot remember uh, what it is, but there are some, you know, miracles that we can dismiss because they are simply a pagan story attributed to Jesus. And doubting one miracle does not mean that all the miracles are false. Now, some people that um, believe the Bible is infallible will say that if you don't believe one little thing the way they believe it, then you think that the entire Bible is false, and that is not true. We can treasure the Bible and love it and still know that there are some parts that are um, simply more useful to us than others. And this the story about uh, Jesus, the demons, and the pig, where you have a clearly a pagan story attributed to Jesus, we can say, well, that miracle probably didn't happen. Or the miracle of the fig tree, where it's not, it's not really that miraculous, we can say, well, that probably wasn't a miracle. Because we doubt these, it doesn't mean that all of them are false. And I think that a lot of them are true, personally. But also, you know, there's good reasons uh, not to take some of them literally. And we need to know that miracles of Jesus are closely related to the kingdom of God. And the reason why is that when the kingdom of God manifests itself, it makes all things new and all things whole. And Jesus being the, uh, the Son of God, and that is the prince of the kingdom, the first heir of the kingdom, he gives to us the presence of the kingdom of God without the kingdom of God completely manifest. Like he only healed a select number of people, but whenever the kingdom of God comes, okay, there it is, sorry about that. Uh, when the kingdom of God is realized in total, everyone will be healed. So this is the good news of Jesus, that he's coming to bring perfect healing and order into our lives. And the kingdom of God is coming soon. Okay, about the teachings of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to cover the points that Metzger makes and add uh, maybe a little bit to it. Uh, Jesus' teachings are characterized by picturesque speech. He also is very fond of the pun. And I say uh, regularly that I edit Wikipedia for pun. And nobody has ever laughed at that. I think it's hilarious. But anyway, he also taught the most famous uh, teachings are parables. He also embraced proverbs and he used poetry. And some of Jesus' picturesque speech is for mnemonic device, and mnemonic simply means memory. Jesus used 
Well, actually, we can say that all of these characteristics of Jesus' teachings are designed to help the hearer memorize the teaching. And you remember, Jesus makes sharp contrasts and extreme statements, like the log in your eye. You cannot take the speck out of your brother's eye unless you take that big log out of your eye. You know, that's something that you can remember for the rest of your life. You know, that's it's kind of funny, and it is uh, very telling, and it's just a, it's a very powerful teaching because of the, the uh, very colorful nature of it. And then part of this picture of speak, speech also is overstatement. Um, and this overstatement is characteristic of Near Easterners. Um, and Near Easterners, Near East is where Jesus is from. You know, that's the Near East. Um, and the one time when Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother, then you cannot be my disciple. Well, he's not telling them to, to actually hate as in despise, but he is telling them you need to sever a little bit of these traditional family ties, you know, where you do whatever your father wants you to do, or whatever your mother wants you to do, and you give that up and follow him. So, uh, that's something that we need to be careful of whenever we are interpreting the New Testament, because uh, it doesn't make sense to use what Jesus is making as a sharp contrast, you know, like the speck in your eye and the log in your eye to uh, hinder our spiritual growth. You know, we need to... Um, the point of that teaching is you can't remove a log from your eye. So you can't remove the speck from your brother's eye. The best we can do is love each other. And then the hating the father and mother. You don't want people in the West, you know, that don't understand the Near Eastern overstatement. You don't want people actually hating their parents because they want to be a disciple of Jesus. You were taking it out of the context, out of its original context. Now puns are something that I enjoy. Uh, and the ancient Jews were absolutely enthralled with puns. You know, and they're all over the Hebrew Bible. And that's what makes one of the things that makes the Hebrew Bible so difficult to translate because it basically means that Jesus can use the same word with different meanings in the same sense. You know, and that's something that we lose in translation because we will see the same word over and over again, but Jesus could be using it as a pun. And we never see it, and we never, ever, ever see it in translation, because you just can't do that. With there are um, different meanings of the same word, and yet they're not translated differently, so you can't you can't get the pun. Uh, this is something, unfortunately, you're going to have to learn uh, Greek or Hebrew, or have a really good commentary, or maybe the student Bible has notes in it to tell you. Uh, where the puns are. So I wish I had an example for you, but it, it makes sense. You know, like, um, I'm, I'm almost thinking of, uh, well, anyway, I, I, will, I will give you an example. Uh, I'll find one for you, and uh, definitely one is going to be on the midterm. So I'll find a few for you so you can see um, how Jesus can use the same word uh, with different meanings. But you can imagine how difficult that is for churches who want to divide over uh, one little word in the New Testament. Well, it can mean different things. Okay, parables. This is what Jesus is famous for. There are teachings that are, that are in a story. And, you know, the story is fabricated. Uh, you know, like the parable of the prodigal son is so real and so personal that it seems like it has happened over and it has happened over and over and over again throughout history. But Jesus is using it as a, uh, an example of God's love and he's not giving 
a historical account of a son uh, leaving his father with his inheritance. You know, it's a te it's a teaching s story that has a moral, uh, and maybe even several morals and several points. They are beautiful, but they are challenging to interpret. And I mean, we have been going around in circles for two thousand years trying to figure out what these parables mean. There, you know, there is consensus. You know, like we we think that. Um, the parables mean thus and such because of their historical context and all that, but there's so many different aspects of a parable that it, you never really stop interpreting it, and that's what makes it so much fun. But, you know, when you try to actually apply it to your life, you know, you need to be a little bit more grounded than just uh, looking at something beautiful. Um, and that's part of the thing that's... Uh, heartbreaking about the New Testament is that people were trying really concerned and we should be concerned about applying it to our lives but we limit uh, what the text can mean so many times whenever we do that. The parables reveal a principle of God's government or the world of human beings. Now the principle of God's government is like uh, the way God is going to rule um, the world whenever he takes over and he makes all things new with the coming of the kingdom of God or the world of the human and that's usually negative you know um, this is the way humans are and the parables the parables show us how humans are and how humans can be whenever we believe in God it teaches theology that is what is God like and how does God deal with people? They teach who God is and what people can be. Okay, you know what a proverb is. It's a pithy saying or a maxim. Now, this is interesting because uh, proverbs can contradict each other uh, and other proverbs and still be true. You know, you have uh, one proverb that says it's, it's you must save your money you know a penny saved is a penny earned and then there's another proverb that says something like you know you need to buy, always buy the highest quality because you will save money in the end so you know we have in the Bible there's a book of proverbs and there's a lot of proverbs that look like they contradict each other but that's the way wisdom is you know wisdom is truth encased in realistic and um, practical living and we know that there are many contradictions in life and the Proverbs balance out this wisdom but they cannot be taken like when Jesus gives a proverb it cannot be taken as, as a single rule that rules your entire life you know this proverb is true only within the framework of thinking of the proverb. It's not going to be true in every aspect of life. When you apply it, you're sometimes going to uh, destroy yourself if you are taking it out of context. So it's something that we need to learn how to identify and learn how to interpret, uh, especially if we're using the Bible as a guidebook for our lives. You know, you don't want to take the Bible lightly whenever you whenever you take your interpretation lightly whenever you're applying it so heavily. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. Jesus also uses poetry. Now, poetry is extremely important in Roman writers, and I would say Greek writers uh, too, Greek and Roman. Uh, I've read a whole lot of Greek, a whole lot of uh, Latin works, and they quote poetry like the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. You know, the poets are the people that educated, uh, and when I say they, they educated, the Greek and Roman, Greeks and Romans read poetry to become educated, kind of like um, in the modern age, uh, you know, the pilgrims read, primarily read the Bible uh, for their education. Well, that's what the, the Romans and the Greeks read Greek and Roman poetry. 
And if you take up a classic uh, work like Plutarch, or uh, you know someone else that wrote during the first century or earlier in Greek or in Latin, like um, Seneca wrote in Latin, Plutarch wrote in Greek, and both of them quoted both contemporary and ancient poets all the time. It's also very important for Hebrew writers. When you read the Old Testament, most of it is poetry. And it's poetry for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. For one thing, you can memorize it easily. And also, it's just beautiful. It's a way that the Jews envisioned God speaking to them. Or the way God did speak to them was in poetry, with the rhyming and the meter and the repetition of words. And the Gospel uses Hebrew poetry. Now, the way that we identify poetry, if you don't know the language, it's extremely difficult. If you do know the language, it's very easy to identify. And, you know, because you can see the meter and, you know, it changes. Um, like, I'll be reading lines of Greek and come to poetry, and I can suddenly see that the meter is different, uh, and maybe even it rhymes. Uh, although rhyme is uh, much, much less important than rhythm. Uh, and, and you can you can really pick it up uh, easily, but you can see in Psalm 19 the parallelism is something that Hebrew poets used a lot. You know they didn't use rhyming, but they did use parallelism, and you can see this: the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. You know heavens and firmament. Um, are parallel to each other, and then proclaims his handiwork is parallel to telling the glory of God. So that's how uh, Hebrews um, or Hebrew uh, uses poetry. It's just parallel ideas. Okay, Jesus taught, of course, a lot about God. Now, his, most of his teachings are proclamations. They are declarations that aren't supported by long philosophical um, debate and dialogue. He was proclaiming the gospel of God. He was not giving us a philosophy of life like, other, like many, many other people did. He taught that God is concerned with all people God is benevolent. That means that God is not our enemy. God loves us, and God wants to take care of the world. Jesus said that God is the divine Father, not only of Israel, but also, and especially, Jesus and his disciples, and also, uh, sometimes, of the entire world. Okay. The kingdom of God is something that I've referred to a couple times earlier. It basically means, in the New Testament, that God is going to renew all things, and He's going to establish a new kind of kingdom, a new government, that is perfect, without suffering, and something that, uh, a place where God can completely reveal His goodness to all humanity and the whole earth. Now, this Kingdom of God idea does not appear in the Old Testament or in the Old Testament Apocrypha. Now, we remember that the Old Testament Apocrypha is a group of writings that are not in the Old Testament, but they are in the intertestamental period, they are written between the, the time of the Old Testament and the time of the New Testament. And they include a lot of ideas that appear in the New Testament, but not the Kingdom of God. There's this idea... Well, the Jews did look forward to a time when God would establish Himself as the King of Kings. But that was more of a nationalistic idea, like uh, a, a, fellow, a fellow like the... Maccabeans would uh, liberate the Jews from Roman rule 
and establish Jerusalem as the center of the world uh, with God fully in control, like a new theocracy, basically. Now, in the New Testament, with Jesus' teaching, there is a present and future kingdom. Jesus, with his birth and especially his ministry, it begins the presence of the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus is healing, and Jesus is bringing unity, and preaching peace, and calling people to repent. You know, He is the present kingdom, the sign that the kingdom has come. And not yet, or present, or future, I'm sorry, the not yet aspect means that the kingdom is not completely fulfilled yet. You know, obviously, God has not made all things right in the world. But, at some point, God will. This is called eschatology, or the last times, study of the last times. This is called now and not yet. The kingdom of God is now, but the kingdom of, the kingdom of God is not yet. You know, it's still something that is coming. It is a gift that people may inherit, and a kingdom that is coming. And repentance is the key. Okay, Jesus is teaching concerning himself. Uh, we have the Messiah, the Son of Man, and the Son of God. There are three titles that um, are used to describe Jesus in the New Testament. The Messiah is Hebrew for anointed one. It is anointed by God. Or this person is anointed by God to do God's will. Jesus rarely uses this term to talk about himself, and it embraces the nationalistic and political expectations that I was referring to earlier, that the Jews expected a Messiah to come, who is basically a military leader, who would kick the Romans out and establish a new theocracy in the temple. Now, this is something that's very interesting. Um, I don't think that Paul ever uses the word Messiah to talk about Jesus. And if he does, it might be one, one or two times, and maybe not even in the authentic Pauline letters. Now, it indicates, you know, we don't say Jesus Messiah. You know, Paul always says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, or just Christ or Lord. But he never uses the Hebrew term. He always uses the Greek term, Christ. That indicates a separation between Judaism and Christianity. Now, the Son of Man is something that Jesus uses um, with some regularity. And I think that it, he calls himself the Son of Man uh, as a title more than anything else. This has a variety of meaning in Jewish writings. It means the frail prophet. You know, it, in, you see the son of man, not the son of God. You know, a son of humanity. It emphasizes the human aspect of the son of man. It also refers to the congregation of saints and the superman. Now, the son of man term appears in the... Um, Old Testament Apocrypha, whereas um, that the other term earlier, hang on, the kingdom of God does not appear in the Apocrypha, but the Son of Man does. And the new meanings that Jesus placed on this term was his, the Son of Man's suffering, death, and humiliations. The Son of Man was supposed to be someone like the Messiah, or basically it's the same idea as the Messiah. You know, that he will come and liberate uh, the Jews. But Jesus said that the Son of Man will suffer, and he will die, and he will, he will endure humiliation. And this is something that, again, causes the separation of Judaism and Christianity, because we believe that the Son of Man was crucified for our sins, whereas they believe that the Son of Man will 
uh, be a victorious um, leader. Son of God appears most frequently in the Gospel of John. Now, this should not be surprising because the, son, the Gospel of John is much more concerned with theological matters than the other Gospels. So, the Son of God appears uh, quite frequently. And Jesus claims and receives honor due only to God whenever he uses the term Son of God. Um, that means that uh, Jesus says he has the power to forgive sins. He calls God Abba, which is Father. It indicates an unshared sonship and special inheritance. And, you know, we read in John, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Well, these have a finality to his sayings, like, like God's finality, whenever God says something. And um, the Ten Commandments is something that I think about. You know, thou shalt not kill, you know, in, um, with Charleston Heston, you know, being Moses, receiving the commandments from God. Now, so it's a very offensive thing to, to Judaism to say that Jesus is the Son of God, especially within the um, co this kind of context, you know, where God is only Jesus' his Father and, and that he has the power to forgive sins, only God can forgive sins, and only God can, can give uh, final statements, you know, that are, that you cannot challenge. So we move on to, it says on the top, I know it's hard to see, um, Jesus' teachings concerning people's duties and relationships. And the three things that we'll talk about is God's relationship to people, person-to-person -person relationships, and rewards for doing God's will. These are Jesus' teachings related to people's duties and relationships. Okay. For God's relationship to people, Jesus taught that people must love and fear God, and we know that that is one of the, uh, the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbors. Jesus taught that all people are sinners, and uh, that means that all of us have a refusal or have refused to live according to God's will. Jesus also taught that inward attitude is key. Now, this is something that is pretty foreign in Roman religion. You know, religion was something that you did to get the gods to give you favor or give you what you want. And for Jesus, uh, religion was in it all in your attitude. Your inward attitude matters. You can't just give your, your tithe. Uh, you have to give joyfully. You know, there's this inward, um, the attention to the inward attitude where... Most religions um, did not pick that up for a very, very long time. And here, the inward attitude is understanding God's concern for the welfare of people when God gave the law. Now, Jesus, part of Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders of his day was that he criticized them for only following the law and not really caring for the needs of other people. Now, this is really key because Jesus did not want people to completely forego the law, but he wanted them to change the way that they interpreted the law and applied the law so that people can be encouraged and poor people can receive the care and attention that they need. And also, Jesus taught, as you remember, prayer and almsgiving should not be done for show. You know, he, he had a lot of conflicts with Pharisees who were praying in the streets and, you know, just showing how religious they were and how, how dedicated they were to their tradition. Well, Jesus taught that your prayer 
and your almsgiving should be done in an attitude of prayer, well, attitude of prayer, and uh, focus on God. You know, it should come out of our love for God and our love for people, and not to appear as if we were more righteous than we actually are. Okay, person-to-person -person relationships. Um, this is really interesting because the golden rule is everywhere. It's almost in every religion that you should treat people the way that you want to be treated. Now, that's the positive way to say it. Treat people as you would have them treat you. The negative way to say it is don't treat other people the way you wouldn't want to be treated. Now, the negative form is more common than the positive form. And some people think that only Jesus gave the positive form of that uh, teaching. Uh, I find that hard to believe, but uh, it's still fun to think that. Um, Jesus also taught, of course, to turn the other cheek. And Christians have uh, thought over how, what that means for centuries. Uh, does it mean that you, for example, uh, will take one hit to the cheek and turn your cheek and take another hit and then you fight? Uh, there's also turn the other cheek for governments. You know, should a government turn their own cheek? Should Christians fight in wars? Um, there's also give to those who beg. And this must be a favorite to uh, Wall Street Wall Street types who have uh, more than enough money for themselves. This has been difficult for me. You know, uh, out in Fort Worth, people beg all the time. Um, most people are homeless that I see that, that beg me for money. But I always think about this teaching. And if I have anything on me, I will give them something. Uh, because I want to honor uh, what Jesus said. And then there's the Good Samaritan, which is also about the same, um, along the same lines. You live in such a way that you can always fulfill His commandments. And that means that you're always ready to do what, um, the, what the Lord needs you to do. And I think about the tithe uh, with this right now because, you know, you can... Uh, have your finances in such a way that it's impossible for you to tithe. And that's been the case with me before. But we need to live our lives in a way that we're always ready to follow God. That is the one of the lessons of the Good Samaritan, of, and of course, uh, its message of self-sacrifice and helping others. Uh, the Beatitudes are uh, good for person-to-person uh, -person relationships. Um, and part of that is uh, turning the other cheek, um, having mercy, and, um, you know, just generally being able to encourage other people. Now, I have Jesus' teaching on divorce, uh, have a star there, because this is one of the reasons why uh, we can say that Jesus existed, uh, because his teaching on divorce is so radical. You know, he taught that we should not divorce or can, or we're committing adultery, you know, whenever we marry somebody that's been divorced. And, you know, Jesus taught that we should not divorce, uh, period. And then there's also, you know, there's that um, exception in one of the Gospels that says, unless, uh, the, unless your partner has committed adultery, then you can divorce. But... Everyone else in the ancient world taught that you could divorce for, you know, some, some believed you could divorce for anything, um, even uh, Jews. There's a Jewish rabbi that taught, you know, you can, you can divorce your wife if she burns her meal. And then another one taught, well, you shouldn't divorce unless she does something, you know, something more serious. But Jesus gave a teaching that had no exceptions. And that's something that can be pretty brutal right, whenever it's enforced by the church. But, you know, you can't stay in a relationship sometimes and be a good human being. But uh, this is something that is so rare in the ancient world that it convinces some people that Jesus existed. Or that this is a 
uh, an original teaching of Jesus, where some of these might be um, added later by the church. Divor the teaching on divorce is something that's so radical that only Jesus could have said it. Okay, now, this is from Metzger. Um, and Jesus taught that we really don't have much rewards for doing God's will. Or at least we should not expect anything. We should do God's will because it's God's will. And uh, we are the best expressions of ourselves as human beings whenever we do what God wants us to do. And Metzger interprets the treasures in heaven as learning to love the things of heaven. It's not really uh, that we're going to have crowns and jewels and pearls in heaven. It means that now, while we are on earth, we are to love the things of heaven. That is, love the character of God. And Metzger teaches that humans have no claim for anything before God. Now, I disagree with, uh, humbly, I disagree with Metzger here, because I think that there are rewards for doing God's will. And I hope uh, that some people will be rewarded that have done wonderful things for their families and for their country and for the world. Uh, I do think that God will reward us. Now, I don't think that humans have a claim to anything before God. I think that God and His love and grace uh, will reward people that have done good things and punish those who have done bad things. You know, it's just uh, what helps me sleep at night, and it's what I think the Bible says. So, uh, anyway, I, I disagreed with Metzger here. Um, I'm not up in arms about it or anything, but uh, and I think he's right that we that we should learn to love the things of heaven. I just think that God is going to reward those who who follow Him, especially in times of hardship. Okay, the Gospel of Luke. Um, I'm going to, unfortunately, I have to be brief on this, but uh, I think we can get a, a little bit into what's going on in the Gospel, aside from the things that we've already talked about today. Uh, Metzger writes, and I agree, I agree with him, uh, that there was a fading hope of the parousia, and parousia means the second coming of Jesus. The early Christians, uh, before the Gospel of Luke was written, you know, between the time of Jesus uh, to about, you know, 60, 70, uh, and especially after 70, um, you know, after the temple was destroyed, um, Metzger thinks that Luke was written at the time when Christians were very discouraged that the parousia did not happen yet. Um, and I uh, disagree with that because uh, this is something that was very popular to believe whenever Metzger was writing his book. You know, th that um, the earliest Christians were devastated that the parousia didn't happen, and it was one of the most divisive aspects of early Christianity. And now... Uh, scholars are, have gotten away from that, and I would be interested to see if Metzger ever abandoned this idea, because it's something that has been uh, pretty convincingly rejected by uh, scholars in the Army for the past 15 years. So, uh, you know, we focus more on the development of the church and not so much on trying to anticipate what's happening in the church, in the community uh, based on one or two little interpretations of, uh, of a text. So um, that's something you can take or leave as you read Luke. Uh, I'd like to know actually if you think that the community was losing um, losing hope in the parousia, but uh, that's, that is something that used to be in style and now is not. So, uh, you know, it's just something you need to know. Uh, wealth and poverty in the community. This is something that is interesting in the Gospel of Luke because 
the um, uh, focus is on unity in the church where there are uh, some wealthy people and some poor people. Um, you can have a pretty big divide between these two groups and certainly there was a big divide in the ancient world between the wealthy and the poor. I mean, they lived um, not radically, they lived radically different lives, but, but they also knew what was happening because, you know, in some houses uh, that were built in the ancient world, they were built like uh, what we call maybe half a city block in, in Lubbock, where I'm from, um, or that, well, there would be one big building. And wealthy people would live in a very large part of the building, and then poor people would live in squalor, uh, you know, on the other side of the wall. So it's, they had an awareness of uh, what it was like to be poor, what it was like to be wealthy, because they were, they were sleeping right next to each other. Uh, and there's also a concern for the relations of the state and the church. And that is the, uh, the Roman situation. This means that Luke has an interest in presenting Christianity in such a way that it's not a threat to Roman rule. And it can be passed around to uh, Roman or Gentile audiences. And perhaps uh, the Romans would then, therefore develop a sympathy for the Christians and not want to kill them. Okay, basic theological ideas in Luke. There is an interest in salvation history, and we call um, scholars call salvation history um, the. You know, okay, I'll explain it like this. You know how if if you're a Christian, you probably think of there were times in your life where God really came through for you, and you can if you. Uh, Lay those out together. Those times, like whenever you were, whenever you were struggling with something and you made it through okay, and then you made it through something else, and then something else later. That's a salvation history. You know, me and my wife uh, have a salvation history in our marriage. You know, we're like, this is where we made it through something that was really tough. You know, and we can identify that, and we can talk about how we made it through. Each one of those times are really, really tough. And, you know, whether it be a financial issue or a death of a family member or, you know, not knowing where we were going to live or needing a job, you know, there's all, there's all these little things in life or big things in life where you know, uh, by faith, you know that God brought you through. Well, that was like the history of the Jews. You know, we all know that in, in the history of the Jews, they suffered greatly. And, you know, they had these periods of long-suffering where God brought them through. And a prophet would come by and say, you know, God did this for us. And God did this for us. God brought us through challenge after challenge. That's a salvation history. And it mean, what it means is God's going to do it again. You know, we can trust in God to bring us through whatever we're suffering now. Because God has brought us to this point. And uh, that's something that was very, very important to Jews at the time that Jesus was living, because we know that they suffered greatly under the Romans, and they suffered even worse under the Greeks, um, or the, uh, the, well, yeah, the Greeks, the Seleucids and the, and the Ptolemies um, from Babylon and from Egypt. That's why I was wondering, should I really call them Greek? But they are Greek. So there's an interest, because... Luke starts with uh, the Law and the Prophets, saying it ends with John the Baptist. It's also the beginning of Jesus. You know, the, the Law and the Prophets are the Jewish salvation history. And Luke is concerned with making Jesus a part of that salvation history. And then there is the Apostleship of the Twelve and the work of the Holy Spirit. Theme. That means uh, I'm done. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and we'll see you next time.